invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. We are in Mark chapter 8, and our verse-by-verse uh, study through this book has now brought us to the end of chapter 8, Mark 8, verses 27 through 38 will be our passage. And once you've located that text, I'd like to read it for us, so if you'll follow along, and then we will briefly pray and begin our uh, time of study this morning. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them, many, teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray. Lord, bless now we pray the preaching of your word. Amos foresaw in his day a famine in the land. It was not a famine of food, but it was a famine of the word. And so we come this morning knowing that we need to be fed. Father, help us to feast, to eat, to be nourished and strengthened, that your word would, would be good food, that it would be sweeter than honey, and that it would satisfy our souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you haven't heard the news by now, the Scarlet Nation is moving. Now, we're just moving a couple of miles up the road, so don't anybody freak out. After four years of shoehorning six kids into bed at night in our little Cracker Jack box of a house, it's time to get a little more space uh, for our family. For some reason, my kids keep getting bigger, and my house was not. So we decided to find a little more room. It's just a couple of miles here, still in forest, of course, and uh, we spent a lot of time this week um, it happened very fast, uh, like 96 hours from one end to the other, and uh, so we're, we're working through that process. My wife asked me to, to make a shameless plug. She says, the only thing I want you to say up Sunday is to say, if anybody has any boxes, please bring those to us. So if you have boxes, drop them off. So as you can imagine, I, I spent a lot of time this week crossing T's, dotting I's, and talking to financial institutions. I noticed something in my conversations. I, I had three mortgage lenders. I liked making them duke it out with each other. So I was, I was talking to the three of them, trying to get my best, best offer. But I noticed I had to fill out an application with all three, that all three of them, their application ended the exact same way. They asked the same set of specific demographics questions. Now, it's something that the federal government requires that they ask to, to, to keep track of these things. Deep down, there's a little part of me that's a libertarian that said, it's none of their business, but I answered, I answered the, the questions. Questions about age and gender and race and citizenship and education, just these, these st sort of standard questions. But what I found so amusing was that I answered the questions and they never asked for any proof. 
Now, I told them, yeah, I was a 39-year-old white guy who was a U.S. citizen that has a doctoral degree. But I could have just as easily claimed to be an 80-year-old Chinese lady who dropped out of high school. <laughs> like, with all the other stuff, my W-2s, my income, my taxes, they wanted proof upon proof upon proof. Like, years of proof in some cases. But this other stuff that maybe is more of who I am in some ways, they didn't ask for anything. No transcripts, no passports, nothing to sort of prove my identity. Well, in our passage today, in Mark chapter 8, we find the Lord Jesus asking us a fundamental question about our identity. Now, fair warning, it's not the question that is obvious in the passage. There's maybe, I think, a larger question that's unfolding here in these verses. The Lord, through this passage here, through his interactions with the twelve, and then his interactions with Peter, and then his interactions with the crowds, Jesus sort of is sort of surveying the spiritual demographics of those who are coming to him. And there's really one big overarching question, I think, that this passage begs to, to ask, and that question is this. Are you a true disciple? Are you a genuine follower of Jesus? And according to our text and the words of Jesus here, if you answered that question yes, and no doubt many, if not most of us would, then immediately Jesus' reply to you this morning is this. Prove it. Prove it. Unlike the bankers and the mortgage lenders, Jesus does not just take your word for it. He expects to see some validation, some proof, some evidence to back up this claim. And the twelve are going to learn, and Peter is especially going to learn, that being a disciple is not just a box you check on a form. That being a disciple is not just some Sunday school answer that you regurgitate. That being a disciple is a way of life and a commitment that impacts what you believe, how you think, and who you are. And so through the words of our Lord today, we are all invited to analyze the authenticity of this claim. In the text, we see what I'm calling three minimal requirements of true discipleship. Three minimal requirements for true discipleship. The first one comes to us in verses 27 to 30. And here we learn, number one, that true discipleship requires the right confession. And that confession is Jesus is Lord. True discipleship requires the right confession, Jesus is Lord. Notice verse 27 says, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. They've been, remember if you will, in the Gentile region. They came back to the Jewish region. They landed in Bethsaida, kind of the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. And now they're actually going a little bit further north. Caesarea Philippi is a, a little bit removed. It's kind of an odd place to go if you know the history. Caesarea Philippi was a, a pagan city. In fact, if you ever heard of the Greek god Pan, if you go to just say there's ruins to the Greek god Pan, the half goat, half man sort of deity. And that's where this took place was at Caesarea Philippi. But along the way, we find Jesus asking a question. Now, if you've been tracking with our study in Mark, you will know that where we are is actually the high point of the Gospel of Mark. Not just because this is eight chapters in and there's 16 chapters, but, but literally what Mark is doing here, he's been building up to this point. We're eight chapters in, we're two and a half, two plus years in, and Jesus has been healing and teaching and revealing himself to the disciples, and now we come to this sort of momentous occasion when he kind of pulls them aside. It's kind of like midterm exams. Remember, you, you, you're, you're in a class for several months, and then the professor finally kind of stops and says, all right, let's see if you learned anything, right? 
That's what Jesus does. He's been doing all of this, and he pulls them away from the crowd. He says, all right, guys, let's talk about this. So we ask the question, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street, fellas? What's the, the scuttlebutt? What do the polls say? What's the average Joe out there? You mingle with the people. Who do people say that I am? Now, what's interesting here is that Jesus is interested at first in his reputation. What's the general thought? Again, if you've been walking through Mark's gospel, you know that this issue of identity has come up over and over and over again. The book started in chapter 1, verse 1, where Mark claims his identity. At his baptism, God the Father spoke of his identity. We've met a bunch of demons who appear to know his identity. And then you come to Mark 4, when Jesus calms the storm, and the disciples look at each other and say, Who is this? And so now we come to Mark 8, and Jesus says, Have you figured it out? Have you got the answer yet? What have the crowds been telling you? And so they answer, 28, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. So there's three answers given here. Now, John the Baptist makes sense. If you remember chapter 6, I think it was, Herod Antipas. Remember Herod? Herod felt threatened when Jesus was doing this, and he says, oh, John has come back from the dead. So that story has trickled down into the community, and some say he's John. Others say he's Elijah. Now, why Elijah? Well, there's lots of reasons, but a, a big reason is because unlike a lot of the prophets like Isaiah and Amos and Jeremiah, Elijah not only was a prophet, but he also worked miracles. That was different. And what's Jesus doing? He's preaching, but he's also working miracles. So they're saying maybe he's Elijah. And then there was always a third group. These are the independents in every crowd. They say, ah, oh, he's just a prophet. It was just the catch-all. It's just, I don't know which one, but he's, he's one of the prophets. Now, in some ways, their answers here are, are pretty complementary of Jesus. I mean, this is pretty rare company. John the Baptist, a great preacher. Elijah, a well-respected prophet of the past. And all three of these answers are understandable, and in some ways, they're flattering. And they're very close. But it's like the old saying goes, that close only counts in what? Horseshoes and hand grenades. Close does not count in theology class. Spurgeon's once said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, it's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Isn't that the trouble? Isn't that the difficulty sometimes? Right and wrong, black and white, that's easy, but it's the gray stuff. And here they're saying stuff that, well, it's, Kind of true, but is it really the whole truth? So Jesus turns and he continued, verse 29, questioning, saying, but who do you say that I am? If you write in your Bibles, underline that pronoun you. It's emphatic. But you, who do you say that I am? By the way, it's also plural. If he was in Alabama, he'd say y'all. Who do y'all say that I am? There's a contrast between the crowds and the popular opinion and these outsiders. There's a contrast between them and these insiders. You've been really close to me. Now, I don't think because it's plural, it's not personal. No, it's incredibly personal. You guys have seen me up close and personal. You guys have been around this. So the question is, who do you say that I am? And, and men and women this morning, please understand me. We cannot get around this question. It is still the question of the ages. Who do you say that Jesus is? That is the most important question any one of us can answer and deal with. And to get this question wrong, as we will see, is to risk everything. So Peter answered, being the self-appointed spokesman of the group. Verse 29, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Now, I think it's easy for us to read this and miss just how momentous this moment was. Peter is the first person in human history recorded in Scripture to come to this conclusion. 
Yeah, Anna, Simeon, some of the others, they sort of got what God was doing. But, but Peter comes with precision and clarity. You are the Christ. It's not what the crowd say. This is something more. And Peter says, I get that. Contrary to what I thought as a kid, Christ, of course, was not his last name. It's not Joseph Christ and Mary Christ. Jesus. No, Christ is a title. It, it simply means Messiah or the anointed one. In the Old Testament, there were three offices, three groups of people who were typically anointed for that role, kind of we would think of ordained, set apart for that role, and that was prophets and priests and kings. They would pour oil on their head. That was the anointing for that particular job. And in the Old Testament, there were lots of people who were prophets and priests and kings, and there were some who were two of those things. Some were prophets and kings and some were priests, but, but, but nobody was all three of them. And that's what Israel was waiting for, the anointed one, prophet, priest, and king. And so in that sense, Peter's confession is exactly right. He, he's, he's got clarity and precision. You are the Christ. Now, as we'll see in a moment, that's about all he's got right. There's a lot more to this. But for the time being, what Peter says is accurate, it is correct, it is precise, and my friends, it is the essential starting point for true discipleship. Jesus' teachings and warnings and scoldings, they have all paid off. What the crowd got wrong, Peter gets right when he makes this confession, you are the Christ. You see, why it stands out is because what the crowds were saying, that he's a prophet. But listen, the prophets were only pointers. Jesus is the point. right? Hebrews 1 says what? That in the past, the prophet spoke to our fathers in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. That what all the prophets were saying was leading up to someone, and that someone was none other than Jesus. And so verse 30 says, and he warned them to tell no one about him. That's actually quite strong there. It's not just, hey guys, let's, let's keep it on the down low. Let's not, let's not tell anybody. No, no, it's actually the word that he rebuked them. It's what he does to the demons, and it's what he does to the wind and the waves. He scolded them and said, shh, don't talk about it. Now why is that? Well, it seems to me, and there's a lot going into this, but it seems to me part of it is, while Peter's right about the confession here, as we're going to see, he's not completely right about what that means. I had a seminary professor who used to say, the only thing worse than not knowing Greek is knowing just a little bit of Greek. Because you think you know more than you do. Right? So Peter he knows a little bit. He's, he's right about this, but Jesus says, all right, before you go announcing this and publicly talking about this, we've we got to clear up exactly what this means. But for now, Jesus, is, his point is, he's correct. Peter got the job title right. Peter has the starting point right. And my friends, for all of us, the identity of a true disciple begins with the correct identity of Jesus. You've got to begin there. Years ago, I remember somebody showing me a, a, one of these really high-powered, expensive flashlights. And it said on the box something like, you know, it, was, it had the um, illuminating power of two million candles. And I was like, we're still measuring stuff in candles? Like, that seems <laughs> weird. But, but he turned it on at night, and man, this thing was bright. You could see what looked like half a mile down the road when he shined this light. And, and one of the kids who was around commented and said, wow, that is as bright as the sun, right? Now you can say that. But imagine if you flipped that. What if you woke up the next morning and looked up in the sky and saw the orange gaseous ball in the sky and said, wow, that's as bright as a flashlight. <laughs> Doesn't work. Why? Because the sun is in its own category. Right? In an effort to complement the flashlight, you've insulted the sun. And that's what's happening here in many ways. 
they were calling Jesus a prophet. And in, in some sense, yeah, they're right that, that Jesus is a prophet. But the point that Peter comes to and the conclusion that he comes to, which is the conclusion that we must come to, is that he's more than a prophet. He is the Christ. He is the long-awaited one. There's a sense in which when we come to Jesus, if we come and we, we don't understand fully and truly who he is, then we're going to miss the point of it all. Christianity has rules, yes, but it's not about rules. Christianity has works involved, but it's not about works. Christianity rises and falls with the issue of Jesus' identity. You can spend your whole life in Sunday school, you can spend your whole life in private school, in Christian school, and you can walk away and know who Abraham is, and you can know who David is, and you can know who Isaiah is, and you can know who Paul is, but it will do you no good if you don't know who Jesus is. That's the issue. Parents, that is the number one question you can ask your kids and talk about. Who is Jesus? Give them that firm foundation, that simple understanding that no one is like Jesus. He truly is one of a kind. He is God's son sent to die on the cross, to rise from the dead. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is King. And by the way, church, we need to be prepared. Did you notice in this text, Peter's confession of who Jesus is is out of step with the popular culture? Do you see that? The culture has an opinion of Jesus. Oh, he's a prophet. He's a this. But what Peter's saying, man, that's a whole new level. And if we're going to be committed and faithful to Jesus, we need to realize that, that there may be those around us who see Jesus as a good teacher, and there may be those around us who see Jesus as a, a good leader, but the moment we stick our neck out and say, no, 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 Jesus is Savior and Lord and God, we're going to be out of step. And it may cost us, which is why the rest of the story is here. This confession is a polarizing confession it is a life-changing confession is an essential cornerstone confession of the christian church it is the litmus test of every religion you ever find yourself talking to somebody you're not sure you can't quite pin them down i was talking to a guy recently and he was saying stuff that was kind of bible-y but i couldn't quite tell what he was and so i finally got around to the point and i said well who's jesus and then the differences became clear True discipleship requires this right confession that Jesus is Lord. That leads to a second requirement, number two. True discipleship requires the right mindset. It requires the right mindset, and that is God over man. Notice what happens in 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now, this is the first of three times that Jesus is going to predict his passion, as we say. By passion, there we mean his sufferings, deaths, and resurrections. He does it in chapter 8. He's going to do it in chapter 9. He's going to do it in chapter 10. Sort of like what we did with our plan to sell our house and to move. We kind of had to ease our kids into it, right? We talk a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Jesus told them in 8. He's going to tell us again in 9. He's going to tell us again in 10 and help them to, to get it. Because the difficulty, it seems, the reason he does this in verse 31 is because, as we said, Peter said, you're the Christ. And Peter got the job title right. But Peter is going to get the job description wrong. See the difference there? He's got the job title. Sure, you're the Christ. But now when Jesus talks about what the Christ came to do, Peter's not going to like that too much. Saying, wait, 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 that's not, that's not how this works out. The moment that, that Peter said, you are the Christ, the disciples would have been amped. They would have been pumped because <coughs> there was all these expectations that the Messiah would come and overthrow Rome and liberate Israel and be this conquering military king who would ride in and, and through battle and war would give the victory. And so when he says this, the disciples here, you're the hero, you're the champion, you're the conqueror, you are the victor. But Jesus says, no, 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 the Christ must first be the victim. And that's jarring. 
He says, there are some things that the Son of Man, notice, must do. And it's not the stuff that you're thinking I must do. The stuff that I must do is what? Suffer many things, be rejected, be killed, and after three days rise again. There's a sense in which this is not a great halftime speech by Jesus, is it? I mean, if you want to motivate your base, this is not a good way to do it. Hey, guys, this is, we're heading into the home stretch here. This is the last couple of months of ministry. Oh, and by the way, not going to end very well. So you can kind of understand the, the feeling here. In fact, it gets amplified by the fact that notice who's going to do this. The elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. That would have been just sort of horrifying. These guys are the religious establishment. I know it's not a one-for-one, one, but maybe this helps you feel emotionally a bit of, of what the disciples were feeling. Kevin DeYoung puts it this way. He said, it's as if Jesus predicted, I will be hated by Congress, despised by the president, and executed by the Supreme Court. That's not what the hero of the story does. That's what the villains, that's what happens to villains. But Jesus says that's what the Christ must do. 32 says he was stating the matter plainly. I love that because much of what Jesus has said up to this point, he has not stated plainly, right? He's used parables. He's used these pictures that they kind of scratch their heads saying, what does that mean? But at this point, it is obvious to everybody standing there, he is not speaking allegorically, he's speaking literally. This is what is going to happen. And Peter picked up on this, and so it says in verse 32, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter says, whoa, 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 whoa. That is no way for the Messiah to talk. That is not Christ-like. The, the Christ is supposed to, to conquer. He's supposed to bring the victory. He, he's supposed to come and to rule and to reign. We don't need that kind of negativity. This may be a bad analogy. I already told a bad analogy, I guess. But and Imagine you got, you got drafted or asked to serve on the board of Microsoft, and Bill Gates walks in the room and he says, do you know who I am? You say, yeah, you're, you're Bill Gates. And he says, you know, you know what I'm going to do with this company? What? what? Tell me. I've led this company in incredible ways, and in the days ahead, I'm going to drive our company into the ground. I'm going to be accused of something scandalous. I'm going to get fired. I'll be the laughing stock of the business world. Microsoft will go bankrupt, and then it's going to bounce back. Now, you probably wouldn't hear the last part because <laughs> of all the stuff that came before it. See, there was this sort of expectation, of this messianic expectation, and Peter clearly has bought into some of this. No, 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 no. In fact, Matthew's gospel, he looks at Jesus and says, God forbid, this should never happen to you. No, th that's not going to happen to the Christ, to the Messiah. Church, listen to me closely. It seems that Peter here got his idea of what Jesus would, should do more from the world than from the Bible. One of the worst mistakes that we can make as a church is if, like Peter, we get our vocabulary from the Bible, but get our definitions from the world. See that? He got the Christ part right. He got the title right. But the job description, completely off. Even as a church, when we think of issues of what is prosperity and what is success and what is good and right and holy, we, we have to define those things as God defines them, not as those around us define them. And it says, turning around, verse 33, and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. The idea seems to be that Jesus says the Christ is going to suffer and die, and Peter says, hold on, and he pulls Jesus aside and says, hey man, you can't be talking like that, like, that's going to kill morale, that is, that is not messianic, you need to knock this off, and he rebukes Jesus, and at that moment, Jesus looks over, and the other 11 are going, like, they hear all this, 
And Jesus, seeing that they heard what he said, Jesus knows this can't go unchallenged. That what Peter has said is actually devastating and damaging to his purpose. There's a sense in which what, what he says here is, is, is so wrong that Jesus turns it says, he said, turns and looks at Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. Think about this. Peter calls Jesus the Christ. Jesus says the Christ must die. Jesus says, or Peter says, no, that'll never happen. And then Jesus calls Peter the devil. Like this thing went down real fast. I mean, it's unraveled on Peter more than I think he thought. In fact, there is a sense in which Peter's words here, I think in some ways, they sound like one of the first instances of the prosperity gospel. Suffer? Pain? Hardship? You're not destined for that. That's not what's in your future. The Messiah's come to win, not to lose. He's come to prosper, not to fail. And Jesus is that kind of thinking is satanic. Get that out of here. I'll have nothing to do with it. Because the way of the Messiah, the way of the Savior, is the way of humility. It is the way of suffering. It's the way of the cross. And that's why he says, you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. That's the key. My friends, think about this. You can do the first part right. You can, you can, you can give the right confession. You can check the right box. You can regurgitate the Sunday school answer and still be rebuked by Jesus. You can get the vocabulary right, but if you misunderstand the job description, if you understand what, misunderstand why Jesus came, it's all for nothing. There's a sense in which Jesus is reminding us here that, that, that God's interest must come first above all other interests. So often our biggest concern in life is what will my neighbors think and what will my peers think and what will my mother-in-law think or what will my friends think but honestly the question that really matters is what does god think i was reminded this week remember the story of joseph and potiphar's wife she goes to seduce him in private nobody would ever know and what happens <coughs> she says come lie with me and 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 joseph's response is what how could i do this thing against potiphar no? He said, what? How can I do this thing against God? The only way you say that response in that situation is if you're constantly asking yourself, what does God want? What is God's interest? What does the Lord see and want in me in this moment, in public and in private, and in my thoughts and in my words? And Joseph was, was compelled by that prospect. What does God want of me? Do we have that same mind vet, mindset? To wake up each day to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that God's interests comes first? I read an article a while back about a guy who was, who was slamming Chick-fil-A for being closed on Sunday. And he was, he was commenting about how much more money they could make and how much uh, you know, the, their business could do and all this. And I don't know if you know this, but Chick-fil-A's headquarters is in Atlanta, and recently the Falcons opened a new stadium, and inside the stadium is a Chick-fil-A. But guess when the NFL plays their games? On Sunday. And guess what's not open? Chick-fil-A. And this guy was just mocking and going off at, like, how backwards and whatever. And I got to the end of the article, and I didn't get mad as much as I sat there, and I, I thought to myself, he doesn't get it. How sad money is that important that building a business is that important my friends as believers if we don't take a stand for god's interest who will this is the call of a true disciple is to say whatever happens at work or school in my marriage in my home i'm going to put god's interest first that's the second requirement the third and final requirement comes in verses 34 to 38 Number three, true discipleship requires the right priority, which is death to self. It requires the right 
confession, the right mindset, and the right priorities. 34, he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So once again, Jesus says, Who am I? Peter says, You're the Christ. Jesus says, Well, let's not talk about that yet because you guys don't understand what that means. And to prove his point, Peter says, No, 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 like you're not going to suffer and die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. No, 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 this is what I've come to do. And so Jesus now calls the crowd and says, now if my inner circle doesn't understand it, clearly the crowds don't understand it, so let me just tell everybody. Jesus says, the Christ came to suffer and die, and if you're going to follow the Christ, then guess what's going to happen to you? You must be willing to suffer and die. That's what it means. He says, you must take up your cross. By the way, we often speak of earthly inconveniences as our cross to bear a a midterm exam or a nagging boss or whatever it might be. That's my cross to bear. That is such an insult to what Jesus is saying here. This means one thing. It means death. It means to die. This was written likely at the time of Nero where many Christians were dying for their faith and it was not just something in faraway places. Literally, you could show up at church on Sunday and your pastor would be dead. And they read this and understood how serious this commitment was. And yet, if we're not willing to die or we say we're willing to die and yet sometimes we find ourselves not willing to be laughed or to be marginalized, or to be labeled. Jesus says, you're going to follow me. Notice he says, if anyone wishes to follow me. This is not just for the 12. This is not just for the crowds. And this is for us today. Count the cost, he says. If you're going to follow me, understand what may come with this. Jesus says, if you want to wake up, if you want to follow me, then when you wake up in the morning, before you go to the kitchen, you need to first go to the gas chamber. Before you grab your purse and walk out the door, you need to also grab your noose. You need to realize that following me may put you in the crosshairs of persecution and death. Are you willing to go that far? He says in 35, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever wishes, loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. By the way, notice closely there at the end of verse 35, It's specifically whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels. Some people read this and think, oh, Jesus is just saying that in order to be a nice person, you need to put yourself last. That's not what he's saying here. True discipleship is not putting yourself last as much as it is putting Jesus first. That's his point. And you put him first to such a degree that even if it means that that there will be hardships and difficulties, it's worth it because of what will be gained. Notice his questions in 36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? By the way, first off, notice there Jesus believes in the reality of our soul. Right? We live in a world that denies this. You're just matter. You're just an animal. My friends, that's not true. There is a part of you that cannot be seen. And there's a part of you that, that, that will live on into eternity in that sense. But notice the language of 36 and 37. This is, this is the language of an accountant. If you work in business or finance, look at those words there. Profit, gain, forfeit, give, exchange. Those are business terms. Those are finance terms. Jesus says, if you know how to balance a checkbook, you know how to work the numbers. Jesus looks at them and says, listen, when it comes to your soul, when it comes to this life, when it comes to eternity, do the math. Go ahead and work the spiritual spreadsheet and see what the bottom line is. Is it really worth it, he says, to gain the whole world? Is it better to have everything for a moment and then nothing for eternity or nothing for a moment and everything for eternity? That's the exchange here. In 38, he says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him 
when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus looks to the future. Once again, he, he reminds us of the end times. So often when we think of the end times, we're too quick to think of timelines and charts. And while those things aren't bad, Jesus is more interested not in whether or not we understand the specifics of the end times, but do we understand the significance of the end times? Do you understand the significance of Judgment Day? Do you understand what it is to stand before a holy God? When he says her to be ashamed of me, we're, we live in a culture that's, that's about right and wrong. In the, in the Eastern culture, there's this idea of shame and honor. When he uses this, this would have been the most horrifying thing to say. If you are ashamed of me, in other words, if you reject me, then I'm going to reject you in the end. And in all of this, we see the great paradox of our faith. That being a disciple costs you nothing, but it costs you everything. It costs nothing to sign up, but it costs everything to those who do sign up. The way of Christianity is backwards. You see, our discipleship is not to follow the world's ideas of success. It's not to follow the world's idea of prosperity. That our discipleship is to follow his lordship. And his lordship says the way up is down. The way forward is backwards. You win by losing. The first will be last. And the greatest will be the servant. That's how we should approach true discipleship. And Jesus would ask us, are you more attached to this world? Or are you attached to the Lord? We all know the name Jim Elliott missionary who died many years ago i find it interesting that with time and notoriety i think we lose perspective on his story because when jim elliott was speared to death on the muddy shores of a south american riverbank at that moment virtually nobody knew who he was he had no money he had no fame he did not have a single convert to speak of and yet at the age of 28 jim elliott died for jesus having nothing and entered into glory where jesus gave him everything that's the point do you have that kind of faith or is discipleship just a Ah, it's a convenient box to check to fit in with my family, to fit in with my culture, with my friends, with my school. Or is it something that's gripping? That's why Jim Elliott's words that he wrote in his journal many years before that event where he died, those words are so haunting. When Jim Elliott wrote those famous words, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. That's what he did. That's what true disciples have as their mindset, as their priority, and as their goal. That Jesus is more valuable than anyone or anything else. Can you say that this morning? Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, O Lord, for really the, the piercing challenge of Jesus in this passage help us lord all to examine ourselves to look at our confession to look at our mindset and to look at our priorities father help us we pray forgive us of our sins and shortcomings and renew within us the courage of a disciple the faith of those who would be willing to go even to get pay the ultimate price if it was so called father we ask and we pray that you would strengthen the persecuted church today no doubt there are men and women even now who are chained to dungeons for their faith in jesus grant them courage O lord we pray and help us father to not forget them in that situation and may we lord have the boldness to speak and live for jesus even if it would put us in the crosshairs Thank you, Lord, for the call of Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.